Thank you to the panelists for their insights into the regulatory environment around data protection. For our audience, all previous sessions of the Global Technology Summit are available on Carnegie India's YouTube channel. And now on to the next uh, panel. The Indian Personal Data Protection Bill 2019 provides for the local storage of certain kinds of personal data. The rationale behind localization is based on economic and national security grounds. But there are benefits to allowing free flow of data as well. To discuss what the right balance between localization and internationalization of data should be, we have Rishabh Bailey, legal consultant, National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, Catherine Charlotte, Director, Data Governance, Google, Ralph Soar, Deputy Head of Unit International Data Flows and Protection, European Commission, Rob Sherman, Deputy Chief Privacy Officer, Facebook. The discussion will be moderated by Smriti Prashira, researcher, National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, and fellow CyberBricks Project. Hello. Hi. 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 We have, sorry, we have five seconds left. So four, three. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the Carnegie team for having us here. I'm delighted to be with this stellar panel. And over the course of the next hour, we're going to discuss what is clearly a very critical issue around uh, geopolitics of technology, around uh, you know where uh, health data is going, where uh, financial data is going, the question around where data is to be stored and how countries are thinking about that issue. And before I bring in the panelists, I'm just going to take a few minutes to uh, you know set the context of what we plan to cover. And uh, you know as we know, the debate around localization and questions about how countries are looking at this is coming from several perspectives. But here are three ways of thinking about it. Right, the first is is a civil liberties perspective, a privacy perspective that we care about where our data is stored because we are worried that other countries may not be as careful about it. Right. The second is a sovereignty perspective. It's a you know the responsibility of the nation state kind of perspective, which is that to do our law enforcement related function, we are worried about the fact that you know we are not able to access this data when we need to, and that is uh, you know deterring our functions. And equally, it's about where the data is stored has something to do with how the revenues accrue, how you're able to tax that, and that is somehow constrained and you're not able to get the benefit of that. And the third is a purely economic perspective, which is about, you know, we want data centers, we want infrastructure to build in the country, we want the local economy, the AI system in the country to gain from uh, data, and that's also driving debates around localization. And, you know, some of us have been in these, all of us have been in these conversations for a while, but Rob and I were actually on a similar panel at GTS in 2018 and I was gathering my thoughts and thinking about what has changed since then on this topic of localization and clearly a lot has changed right and here are three highlights of what has changed so in India we've seen a change in the government's position on localization where it's clearly softer in the 2019 bill than what it was in the 2018 bill there are still localization provisions but it's way softer than what we had earlier Europe, you know, I'm going to defer to Ralph to you on that because uh, he's the expert who's in the thick of things there. But Europe has seen some changes and a lot of developments around debates on data flows. And finally, the year that this has been has clearly made us all think a lot about, you know, data flows and the Internet and the Internet economy and how we are so dependent on that. And, you know, coming from that, I'm going to play devil's advocate and say that I see countries being worried 
about the fact that this year was about disruption of movement of physical goods of people but tomorrow if the disruption is about data and the internet then you know we need to be self reliant is what india is at least india is thinking so with that ralph i'm going to bring you in first uh, i know you've been in the thick of the things around you know conversations on data flows in europe it's been 2 years since the gdpr can you tell us about what's happened and you know your opening remarks on that Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, and, and thanks for the for the invitation uh, to to this panel. Um, indeed, I, I would agree. Uh, it has been uh, an interesting uh, two years um, uh, because of the fact that we have uh, new rules uh, in in Europe, but also because of uh, indeed uh, uh, broader developments uh, developments in, in in our case law. Um, and uh, and and also of course certain things that that uh, have happened, uh, privacy related incidents that have happened and others that have and COVID uh, that have, have uh, put uh, let's say additional focus on 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 all of these these topics. Um, when it comes to international data transfers, uh, so transfers from the European Union to to third countries, um, the the GDPR. Uh, has not uh, sort of for the first time uh, created a a framework for that uh, we we already had data protection rules since the late 90s uh, and 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 there's a considerable continuity i would say uh, uh, in terms of the rules uh, from the uh, previous uh, framework uh, you can also see this uh, by the fact that that certain instruments that we have uh, and have adopted under the previous regime uh, old uh, adequacy findings for example but also the so-called uh, uh, model contract clauses um, uh, are carried over from the from the previous regime to the current one um, what what has changed i think uh, from the previous regime is uh, uh, that our treaty basis uh, for the European Union uh, has has changed. Our our fundamental rights framework has has evolved, uh, and and data protection uh, in 2009 was was formally recognized as a a fundamental right, and and this fundamental rights basis uh, makes uh, a considerable difference, I would say, in the way this is looked at. In particular, uh, how these questions are looked at by our court, um, uh, and and. Our rules clearly have a, a double objective. On the one hand, facilitating data flows, and that's why we have uh, further expanded, let's say, the toolbox uh, for for data transfers. Uh, so, so the instruments that you can use to transfer uh, data from Europe uh, elsewhere, but at the same time, uh, uh, ensuring the continuity of protection. And, and this idea of of making sure that protections that are afforded within the European Union are not lost uh, when data travels abroad is, is I think, essential. Uh, and, it, and it makes sense uh, uh, in, in, in principle um, because uh, data, of course, uh, uh, is not stationary. It, it, it moves and it increasingly so uh, uh, moves uh, uh, from one place uh, to, to another. Uh, if you only focus your protections on 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 the domestic uh, uh, market on, on on your own jurisdiction then in a way uh, the protection is 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 insufficient it's it's only half of of, of what you need uh, but of course uh, there is a balance to be to be struck and and i think it's about this balance that some of our uh, court cases have 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 focused um, and and one can also see uh, very clearly that that um, uh, individuals, uh, our citizens uh, and consumers, have have woken up uh, to the issue. Uh, uh, we, I think we are living in an era of of strategic litigation also around this. Uh, a number of cases have been brought uh, data transfers both on the commercial side, but also. We had a number of cases on on um, data uh, transfers by public authorities, in particular uh, law enforcement authorities, um, and and our most important tool, uh, our most comprehensive tool, which is an adequacy finding, um, so a finding that a third country has a comparable level of of protection, which then allows the free flow of data to that uh, third country. Uh, it, it's clear that this is uh, in, in the past. This was more a technical exercise, uh, uh, and it has moved to something which is much more legal, legally framed, uh, and 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 therefore also contentious. Uh, 
Um, and the two uh, uh, Schrems cases, not just the the second Schrems case, Schrems is, uh, being the, the, the name of the litigant. Uh, uh, in the first Schrems case, he was still a student. Uh, by now, he, he runs a, a privacy NGO. So he, he brought very uh, two very important cases, the Schrems 1 and Schrems 2 cases, and, and, and these go to the core uh, of, 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 of these questions. Um, uh, they are not sort of anti-transfer uh, judgments. They, they are not uh, uh, the, the objective of, of these judgments or what the court decided was not to stop uh, transfers, but, but they go to the core of the question of what does continuity of protection mean? Uh, and 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 very much uh, put the stress on the on the, on the fact that uh, you you have to look at the overall risk uh, to data when it when it moves from from uh, the EU elsewhere. Uh, you cannot, for example, stop uh, just at how a uh, a data importer, a commercial operator in the third country protects the data, but you also need to to have in mind that there might be risk to the data that come from government interference in the in the third country. Uh, and and the, the Schrems 2 case in particular is very much focused on what are the limitations and safeguards that, that need to be ensured around such uh, government access. Um, my last point, uh, uh, so, so, so it's a, it's a, a complex issue, uh, certainly. I think uh, we are still trying to work through these judgments and, and to see uh, how we, we, we still can uh, ensure this double objective of facilitating data flows, but, it, but uh, making sure that the protections in a way travel with the data. Um, but, but the important is that uh, this is not about uh, data localization. Uh, uh, this is not uh, part of our policy. Uh, it's it's not part of our legal framework. Um, uh, we we don't want to to uh, keep data uh, in Europe uh, because we we are export oriented. Uh, we believe that that uh, uh, data transfers are important on the commercial side. Um, for example, to to be able to access services of, of, of uh, uh, providers in, in third countries uh, for which you might have to, to transfer data, uh, but also, of course, uh, for cooperation between public authorities uh, and increasingly for law enforcement cooperation. Now, all of this involves uh, data transfers and we want to maintain them. But, but I think uh, we, we now see that we need to work uh, uh, hard and work together with third countries uh, to to find uh, solutions, ideally multilateral solutions, uh, that ensure this uh, continuity of protection that I was I was talking about. Um, and I, I hope we will have um, a chance maybe later on still to to discuss, for example, things like the Cybercrime Convention, uh, uh, where where uh, also data exchanges play a crucial role, but where we also uh, try to make sure that, that data protection safeguards are are. Uh, part and parcel of, of, of this multilateral arrangement. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ralph. You've set an excellent context. And I want to bring uh, Catherine in at this point. You know, Catherine, as Google, as a company which is really in so many jurisdictions grappling with this flux of data protection laws that are coming, being overridden, struck down, it's all, you know, in a state of flux. So what does it mean for you in terms of compliance with you know, a divergence of data protection laws and a divergence of views around data flows in particular. Yeah, of course. And and first of all, thanks to you and Carnegie India for hosting this conference. I'm I'm all the more grateful to be here as a Carnegie alum. Uh, I know what it takes to, to pull this off and it's really impressive. So um, thanks for having me. Um, so the question about what do divergent localization norms mean for companies? Um, so to start with the obvious restrictions on data flows for Google um, uh, impact our global services. We operate a globally distributed network with the same security controls, same privacy controls, um, access to information. Um, uh, sorry, excuse me, access and information wherever you are in the world. And because of how our network is deployed, Restrictions on data transfers and especially localization requirements harm our ability to provide consumers with the same Google experience wherever they're geographically located. Um, and we've seen in Europe, as Ralph was talking about, um, 
uh, the decision made to invalidate EU US privacy shield um, and the potential disruption really to the global economy when cross border data transfer um, uh, mechanisms are, are disrupted. And depending on the nature of the data localization, um, these kinds of rules might limit consumers' choice for service providers. They increase costs for businesses and not just big businesses, um, but small ones too, um, which can get passed down to um, uh, consumers. And I think more generally beyond Google, of course, data flows are critical for all kinds of things, whether that's customer service or anti-fraud, cybersecurity, and all sorts of uh, the basic daily functions of living in an in international world. Um, so in terms of compliance, I and mean, we ensure compliance with global privacy laws, we do this across jurisdictions. Um, we uh, keep up with the range of laws that are uh, 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 incoming around the world. Um, we've been able to develop a compliance structure and a framework. Um, we're lucky that as a large company, our services are backed by the strongest technological and organizational safeguards. Um, we have, we've got dedicated privacy teams and security teams. We've got annual reviews by third-party auditors and privacy engineering teams that can uh, work on privacy by design and privacy default. But even with all that in place, it's really important for us and for other businesses and for consumers to benefit from interoperable privacy protections. So I guess that's my third point really, which is cross-border certification mechanisms um, are really important mechanisms that can protect privacy and promote innovation. Um, and because we believe in an open internet, we believe that strong privacy laws also contain strong provisions for allowing cross-border data transfers. Um, as Ralph mentioned, there's a toolkit in Europe um, that allows numerous data transfer mechanisms um, created under the GDPR to give companies a broad toolkit with which to transfer data. Um, and these kinds of mechanisms and having a range of mechanisms like this um, in the toolkit are essential for developing development and growth, um, including of emerging technologies like AI, 5G, and blockchain. Um, blockchain, just as an example, is completely dependent on various nodes containing exact replicas of data. Um, so if data is prevented from flowing from one territory to another, it's inevitable that blockchain nodes become incomplete or different depending on their location. Um, so it's for these reasons like this that Google's a proponent of multilateral certification regimes um, like the APAC cross-border privacy rules certification. Um, and that's a mechanism that supports data transfers across nine different APEC economies, um, very diverse economies, and continues to grow in utility and uptake. Um, so I guess I'll just leave it at, um, you know, we, we believe India should have strong privacy law. We believe that such law is not incompatible with the free flow of data across borders. Um, and that's why we supported efforts to include more tools, including things like certifications that I was talking about in India's personal data protection bill. Um, and, and, you know, bottom line, we believe data flows are necessary. Um, so are demonstrations of privacy, compliance, and, and user trust. Um, and look forward to talking about that uh, more, more in this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. I'm going to bring Rishabh in here because, you know, a lot of what we've talked about as where uh, localization restrictions are coming from is in the privacy context. But we know from the Indian experience that this is not the only ground which is driving privacy conversation. So can you paint that bigger picture, at least from, you know, our the Indian perspective on what is driving the calls for localization? Uh, thanks, Smriti, and thanks for having me at this discussion with these wonderful panelists. Um, I think it's clear that while more and more countries are, of course, discussing this issue of localization, India has been one of the leading proponents of such measures over the last few years, whether it's the privacy bill or in certain other um, instruments that I'll just discuss briefly. 
Um, so we've had also a number of policy interventions and laws that have tried to implement both direct and indirect localization measures. So you had, of course, direct measures in things like the PDP bill that you pointed out, where there's a clear mandate to localize certain data sets. But you also have somewhat more indirect measures being taken, for instance, through limiting FDI in specific sectors, say in the digital media space and so on. Um, now, as you pointed out, privacy concerns, the need to enforce local laws have actually been two of the biggest reasons for this entire localization debate. And in the absence of a privacy law, many of the measures that we've seen over the last three to four years have been sectoral and deal with data that can be considered to be particularly sensitive or where there's a perceived need to ensure easy access to the data for regulatory purposes. So, for example, there have been proposals to localize health data and certain types of data in the financial sector, of which I think the most commonly cited example or the most discussed example is the RBI's directive to payment system operators in April 2018, which basically completely prohibited the foreign transfer of payments data unless there was a foreign leg to the transaction. So this was ostensibly done to enable better monitoring and supervision of the sector. So similarly in, say, the health sector, the draft information security and healthcare bill sought to localize health records. I mean, this law was then shelved because of the localization provisions in the PDP bill. Um, and so now the new health data management policy, which has been published under the National Digital Health Mission, doesn't actually contain any localization mandate because health data is made subject to the broader requirements in the PDP bill. Um, so privacy and data security have been cited as reasons for localization even outside the PDP context. Though, of course, many of these proposals, as I said, have been shelved given the introduction of the bill in Parliament. Um, it's also worth keeping in mind that many people, including members of the Sri Krishna committee itself, which drafted the 2018 version of the bill and reportedly some members of the parliamentary committee, which is looking at the bill, have questioned whether localization measures do in fact enhance privacy. And there have been similar questions about the need to put in place norms to you know, enable regulatory supervision. Since, for instance, the RBI already has significant power over regulated entities, including the ability to call for information, so on and so forth. Now, in addition to these privacy and law enforcement concerns over the the last few years, we've also seen this development of the data sovereignty paradigm that you referred to in your initial comments, where we're seeking to implement localization measures more as an economic or strategic tool. So, for instance, the RBI's discussion paper from September 2019 specifically cites data sovereignty as a reason for extending localization measures to payment aggregators and all the other intermediaries in the payment ecosystem. So this concept of data sovereignty, which I mean, simply uh, put, implies that Indian data should be controlled by India and used for Indian benefit, has also been articulated at the cross-sectoral level in, say, the economic survey of 2019 and also the two draft e-commerce policies of 2018 and 19. Um, now, while the uh, eco uh, economic survey itself doesn't speak specifically of localization, it's clear in positioning Indian data as being a resource that should be used for advancing only national interests and goals. Uh, the e-commerce policies, however, do specifically link the issue of localization to economic interests. As you mentioned, growth in the AI and ML spaces, aiding in job creation, so on. Uh, this line of thinking that we need to be more protectionist, that we need to help Indian companies in the digital ecosystem while also securing broader strategic interests also motivates the thinking of the recent Gopal Krishna committee report on non-personal data. So this broadly adopts a similar position on localization to the PDP bill. So it proposes this tiered system of localization of sensitive, general and critical non-personal data. The report itself claims that these measures are required to enable in, uh, you know, the imposition of Indian law and to ensure protection of data that's prone to de-anonymization. So basically, the idea is that in order to successfully enforce data sharing mandates, which are ostensibly needed to ensure more equitable use of data across the ecosystem, there is therefore a need to ensure the data is stored locally. So now localization is increasingly being seen as a tool to fight against the monopolization of the data economy by foreign-owned big tech. Um, this is also meant very often, say, in the context of the RBI's payment directive, that Indian companies have welcomed decisions for localization as their foreign competitors may have to then face additional costs. Um, this perspective has also apparently motivated India's positions at various international fora and in relation to international trade agreements. So, for instance, one of the reasons India stepped out of the RCEP was said to be the inclusion of free flow of data provisions that would have made it difficult to impose the sort of localization norms that India is considering. Um, to actually take a step back here, I mean, you know, given the impasse of the WTO on this issue, there have been a lot of trade discussions that have sought to limit the sort of localization measures that countries can adopt. Can adopt. These are typically being pushed by the developed world, which of course is more to lose in the space, given that most big tech companies are from these countries. India has, however, consistently rejected such proposals, both within the WTO framework and outside. So, for instance, we didn't sign the 2019 Osaka Declaration on the Digital Economy, which sought to create an alternative forum to discuss cross-border 
the data flows. So overall, I would in fact think that law enforcement and economic reasons are actually taking primacy in the localization debate. However, when you analyze even these reasons, it's not entirely clear whether the route we're taking is necessarily the best option. So for instance, India has kept itself out of discussions on additional protocols, the Budapest, Budapest Convention that Raf mentioned earlier, you know, which seeks to deal with this issue of cross-border data access for law enforcement. Um, the problem in India, to the extent that it can actually be called a problem, is in my opinion that data localization is almost treated as a silver bullet solution, you know, to deal with a whole range of problems in the digital ecosystem, ranging from privacy to taxation to competition to law enforcement access, so on and so forth. So it might actually be more helpful if we have a clearer articulation of the goals that localization may achieve in different contexts before implementing such measures. Uh, I think I'll hand it back to you there. I think that provides a brief overview of what's happening in India. Yep, thank you. That's an excellent overview and the big picture of where, you know, Indian authorities seem to be coming from. So, you know, now to you, Rob, with the tough question of given that there are all of these perspectives and there are all of these sometimes articulated, sometimes unarticulated forces which are driving the call for localization, what are the alternatives that you would see if not strict localization, then, you know, what serves these purposes and, you know, what would be Facebook's or your take on, uh, you know, alternatives? Well, well, thanks so much. And, and you know, as you said in your introduction, I was thinking back to this conversation that we had two years ago and, and that a lot has changed. I think not, not least that we are having this conversation virtually rather than in person, which itself relies on cross-border data flows to, to, to make that happen. But also, as Ralph said, that people are thinking more, more in a more focused way about their own data and having it be protected. And so I think the progress on the PDP bill generally is, is I think, really, really important to making sure that there are strong protections for, for, for Indians regardless of who's holding their data. And so and so I think in, in general, we've made a lot of progress. I think, Rishab, you're, 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 the point that you just made about there being different solutions to different problems, I, I think is a really important one. And maybe I can just steal, I think, Smriti, you've, you've talked about it this way, and I know Car Carnegie has 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 published in sort of breaking up the, the goals underlying localization into sort of three big buckets. Um, one is protecting privacy, one is ensuring legitimate law enforcement access to data, and the third is economic development. I know that that's you know, sort of a rough rubric, but maybe I can talk very briefly about each of those three. Um, I think in, in thinking about privacy, one of, one of the innovations of the PDP bill in general, and I think this is true of, of GDPR as well, um, and, and other, uh, other data protection regimes, is, is the protections for the data are not tied to where they are physically located. And so um, under the PDP, P bill, for example, um, not all data would be required to be localized, but that doesn't mean not all data is subject to privacy protection. And that's obviously quite important from the perspective of ensuring that Indians have have their data protected. And so, um, you know, when, when I think about sort of what that means in practice, um, even today, when I think about how Facebook approaches privacy protection for India, um, you know, we've spent significant amounts in, in terms of investment in people and resources to build centralized privacy protections, but also building features like the ability for people to lock their profile, which we rolled out particularly for India, um, to be responsive to those needs. And, and I think one of the things, and, and that ended up having global advantages. And so I think one of the things that, that is true of sort of having this jurisdictional approach and some of the concepts that are in the PDP bill, like codes of practice, allow um, allow the, the, the regulatory regime and the regulator once it's created to establish um, standards for how data should be protected that will apply regardless of where the data goes. Ralph also talked about some of the approaches in, in GDPR, whether that's the, the concept of adequacy um, or whether it's a concept of, of requiring data protections to travel with the data um, that will allow, regardless of where the data is physically located, that will allow there to be protections. Um, I think the flip side of that um, is when you come to the law enforcement access issue. Um, one of the challenges that we face, and again, this is true regardless of where the data, <clears throat> excuse me, is stored, is there are, even if there are laws that would require us to provide access to data um, in, in India, there are also laws, for example, in the US that would prevent us from doing so in certain cases. And so we get into the situation where, again, regardless of the physical location of the data, there's a conflict between different different national laws that, that lay claim to how, how it should be handled. And so, I mean, I think in, in general, you know, the, the, providing access to law enforcement for legitimate investigations is, is, is quite important. I think our most recent transparency report showed that we were producing significant amounts of data um, in response to Indian requests, even under uh, even under uh, e even under current law. 
Um, but I think the challenge is that localization doesn't actually solve the broader problem that a lot of people have have talked about in terms of you know how do you ensure um, law enforcement access. And so I think the solutions, and again we've alluded to them, um, are really in the in the form of you know certainly we've advocated for the U.S. agency that handles MLAT requests to have additional resources, and that's that's important. But also um, you know government to government bilateral agreements. Um, the Cloud Act is obviously the most the, the most renowned one. There are potential for for future kinds of agreements between countries in the future. And I think that's really the best path, um, again, regardless of the physical location of the data to ensure that that legitimate government um, government requests for data can be can be accommodated. And so I think that's that's kind of where, where I would focus there um, on the economic side. Um, you know, I think that that's obviously where where a lot of the discussion has been, and I think you know we've sort of alluded to this in in in, some, in a number of ways. But you know, creation of a data center, you know, there's a there's a limited economic value there, right? There's an upfront construction cost, and then the ongoing operation of the data center is is actually quite limited in terms of the the number of jobs that it creates. And and when I think about you know what are the right mechanisms, there are actually a lot of other forms of economic contribution and cooperation. Like when I think about even Facebook's role, I mean we. And how how we've invested in India that that takes a bunch of different forms. One is you know direct investment in Indian startups. Another is you know we have a VC brand incubator that brings together young Indian startups with the VC community. Um, and then our, our recent investment in Geo Platforms, which is actually our largest non-acquisition investment in another business. And so I think those are the kinds of things that are that that are more lasting and and potentially more robust in terms of in terms of creating investment. Um, but then I think coming to sort of the the sort of future, which is where I hope we'll take this discussion too, is thinking about you know what are the right ways to make sure that data creates a successful and robust future for India. And I think some of what we've talked about in terms of you know sharing de-identified de anonymized data sets in privacy preserving ways, we've done some of that already in the context of yeah you you mentioned the the COVID pandemic and sort of in terms of you know providing data in, in privacy safe ways to inform the response or disaster response and those sorts of things, but also in the context of AI and, and exploring whether there are ways that, that collaboration both on the data side, but I think even more importantly on the innovation side, um, can help to ensure mutual success. And, and, and I think that's where I would go largely on the economic development side, because I think there's much more, much more work to do there. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And we're going to pick up on some of these themes. But before that, I want to come with a similar question to you, Kate. Uh, you know, there's one question for you from the audience. But before that, I'm going to just bring my own question, which is uh, this idea of, you know, trust is something which has been recurring in debates all over GTS since yesterday. And uh, much of it is about, you know, a trust deficit amongst governments, but it's also between governments and companies, companies and users and users and the state. So in all of this, you know, what do you see the role for a corporation to bring in? So a lot is being said about, you know, lack of clarity from the state's end. But at the end of the company and large corporations, what do you think can be done about bridging some of that trust deficit? Yeah, I, I think I, I again point strongly to certification mechanisms, um, which are an increasingly common element of privacy laws that help build trust between countries and promote business certainty and between countries and businesses. Um, laws in the EU and Brazil contain explicit references to certifications, as do some of the draft US privacy federal laws um, that we're seeing in Congress. Um, and in practice, there are two of those regimes, um, uh, well, EU, US Privacy Shield um, and APEC cross-border privacy rules, um, both of those um, uh, representing commitments by government and industry to work across borders to protect privacy and enable digital trade. Um, so I could see India considering a certification regime that could be made interoperable um, with existing certifications um, uh, through government discussions um, that enable India to maintain control over data flows, uh, but not put unnecessary restrictions or localization requirements on them. Um, I think in the context of India's PDP bill, um, there's a few key changes along those lines that would not dramatically alter the bill, um, but would also allow that interoperability between different privacy regimes, um, which I think builds trust more broadly. And, and having um, common approaches to different areas, um, like the definitions of sensitive data, like age protections around child data, um, the recognition 
adoption of concepts like accountability or scaled data breach notifications, all those would be significant ways to improve interoperability um, uh, and, and trust. Thanks. So let me, while I have you, quickly pose this question, which is, uh, you know, you spoke about the Google's user experience for individuals and the question points to, you know, can you share a little bit more about how does uh, data protection law really affect Google's ability to offer services in different jurisdictions? Like from a consumer's final perspective, what does it change no matter where the data is stored? Sure. Um, well, actually, COVID is the per perfect example for something like this. Um, um, COVID developments have reinforced the importance of data flows in really important ways. Um, Rob mentioned one of them, just the fact of this happening, um, uh, this conversation happening across borders. Um, I'd say the first way is leveraging good ideas globally to deal with the COVID pandemic. So for example, a tech solution or an app that's developed in one part of the world that is effective in some way of dealing with the crisis um, can help users all over the world, but that needs to happen very quickly and data flows are necessary to make those available across the world. Um, I would say the same applies for crisis research right now. So researchers need to leverage global infrastructure to collaborate, um, to reduce administrative burdens, to access data sets, um, uh, uh, to come up with the solutions we need right now in, um, uh, in, in dealing with COVID. Um, I'd say the second way is meeting demand at scale. So all of a sudden we saw shifts of millions of workers and students to online platforms, and that requires the ability to shift processing to accommodate the increased flow depending on the needs at that moment in different geographies. And that includes shifting process to different regions. Um, and then the third I would mention is, is um, supporting e-commerce. Global supply chains have to maintain and transfer personal and commercial data across borders. So for example, just to get concrete, like that's keeping track of customers' orders um, and product supplies. And this is true, obviously, not just for um, Google, but for small and medium businesses that rely on overseas markets for revenue. So there's a big in, in, uh, economic impact um, anyways, I could go into lots of other areas um, because this has been a fascinating area um, to watch, um, but I would maybe just worth noting that limiting data requirements, uh, data, data residency requirements just to personal data or a subset of personal data isn't a solution for these kinds of things because in practice, these kinds of requirements still require public and private sector players to re-architect, to substantially localize um, parts of their infrastructure. Um, uh, so it's it's um, it, it still has these these impact uh, impacts that could slow down progress on some of the COVID adaptations. Sorry, Thank you caught you. me on a, uh, something <laughs> we're we're passionate about. No, Thanks that was perfect. <laughs> I'm going to bring you back in, Ralph, into the discussion. You know, uh, so if you look at the India-EU strategic partnership, one of the things it talks about is this idea around convergence of frameworks around privacy and this attempt to move towards adequacy for global data flows. Given what you're seeing of the PDP bill, where do you see you know this partnership going? And uh, and you probably link it to you know the broader points that you raised early, earlier around the con uh, you know Council of Europe resolution, India not being part of the Buddha. Convention, like how does all of this fall into place? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and that, that's something that, that I can say I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about because uh, for the last three years I've been in India uh, many times, uh, had many discussions uh, uh, with, with all kinds of stakeholders from the government to, to, to the JPC to, to, to uh, private stakeholders commercial and, 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 and NGOs. Uh, so we are quite invested in, in this and, and that's why we're quite uh, excited about the, the developments in, in India. Um, I, I can only speak to sort of the last uh, draft that I have seen uh, as, it, as it went to, to, to Parliament. Uh, I still think that this is a very promising uh, uh, draft. It has uh, an, a large number of elements which which I think would uh, bring the Indian data protection regime uh, close uh, uh, to to the European one. Uh, 
and and by the way, also uh, close to many other uh, uh, data protection regimes around the world because we see uh, a lot of conversions uh, quite quite beyond uh, uh, Europe. Um, uh, there, there are also actually a quite a, a number of innovative uh, features in the Indian data protection bill, which are quite uh, interesting. Um, there are. I should also say this uh, a, a, a few things where where I'm I'm less convinced. Uh, let's say uh, uh, the, the localization uh, part is one of them, although this is probably not the one which which necessarily gets into the way of of an adequacy uh, uh, finding uh, because because uh, uh, the adequacy finding is about whether the data is protected in 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 the third country and and less about whether it can move from the third country but but of course you also have to understand that um we we look at adequacy from from a perspective of ensuring the protection of data european data that would go to to india but but at the same time of course we we also have certain expectations that say that this is not a one way street uh, so so in that sense uh, localization is certainly something uh, depending on 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 sort of what it covers that, that concerns us it concerns perspective it concerns us from from a sort of reciprocity uh, perspective and and there's some other features which uh, which we, we will see uh, I think the rules around uh, um, uh, data processing by by public authorities and what are the limits there um, I, I think the uh, the case law in India is is quite strong on this that then there need to be uh, limitations in terms of necessity proportionality which is again would be very close to our concepts. But I think this this probably still needs uh, flashing out, um, and I hope that India is sort of not shy and stopping at the commercial side, but also thinks about uh, uh, data processing by the public uh, uh, sphere, by the by by public authorities, including uh, uh, law enforcement authorities. Um, we have a dedicated uh, well, the GDPR covers actually not just commercial operators, but also. Uh, public authorities, uh, except for criminal law enforcement authorities, but for those, we have a special law, which is called the, the Law Enforcement Directive, which which includes dedicated uh, data protection rules for for that area as well. Um, and 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 we have a convention uh, uh, which also covers uh, the the national security uh, uh, area. So we, we we cover data protection uh, everywhere, uh, and 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 we believe very strongly that it's possible. So that's also something which. Which I would hope um, that uh, because I think there is, especially at the beginning, maybe always a, a certain hesitation or concern that data protection would get into the way of public functions uh, carrying out uh, uh, public authority. But but we don't think that that's the case. Uh, uh, of course, you need to adapt these rules. There, there has to be some balancing. There have to be certain limitations which you wouldn't have uh, on the commercial side. But it's it's possible. All of this would would make uh, 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 an adequacy finding easier, I think, um, and and so we 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 remain hopeful. We remain in in, in contact. Uh, uh, I think the closer uh, the the Indian law is 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 to to our law, of course, the the easier all of this uh, uh, will be. Um, I think what is also important is maybe as a last word, the the role of the data protection authority. Um, that is something that we are. Uh, quite attached to in in Europe, it's 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 actually part of our fundamental right to data protection. Is also the that that uh, the right is protected through an uh, independent data protection authorities, uh, which we believe are important for the individual, but actually also quite important, I think, for for business. Um, uh, a law can only be uh, have only a certain level of specificity. It needs to be further fleshed out through guidelines, and 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 I think that's where. Data protection authorities play an important role. So also there, I, I hope that that I mean this is in the bill, and I hope it will stay there. I think it's 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 very important. And you you asked the question about trust, uh, and 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 maybe because I come from the regulatory uh, side, I I very much believe that trust comes also from uh, strong rules uh, and from enforcement, uh, which doesn't have to be always fines, but they have to be there has to be oversight and 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 someone who can step in. Um, uh, that's why uh, we, we we certainly have uh, uh, just to to finish with this. We 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 have certification as a uh, as part of our toolbox, uh, and so in, on that I, I agree with Kate. But but I think it has to be a certain type of certification. It has to be one that that 
uh, has has clear rules uh, and it's backed up by enforcement and where individuals can also exercise rights. Uh, then I think certification can 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 play uh, an important role. Um, uh, it, it shouldn't be something which is uh, too, let's say, self-regulatory uh, or, or too weak on on enforcement and 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 the clarity of the rules. So so uh, just to say um, something that one maybe you should also think about when when designing the the transfer regime uh, for for the data protection bill. Uh, to 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 make sure clear that there's a sort of framing conditions for 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 these types of of tools. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, thank you for bringing out those critical perspectives. Many of us here, you know, in India who are thinking around the bill agree with a lot of what you said, especially around the law enforcement access, etc. Uh, I'm going to come to you now, um, Rob. Uh, this is. A question from the audience and I'm going to mix it a little with a question of my own, which is that, you know, when data localization provisions are brought about, they obviously affect different firms in different ways. And there's a difference between a large firm like Facebook and how it would deal with it. Of course, there is a compliance cost, but it may be very different for a smaller firm that wants to operate globally to be faced with similar costs. And at the same time, the domestic conversation is about the fact that, you know, sure, innovation can happen, but it's also important that who does the innovation and somehow we want our local industry to be the one innovating. And there is this link drawn between localization of data and innovation uh, by domestic firms. So your response to both of these. Well, I, I think I think it's important to say that that localization imposes a compliance cost on sort of any company, regardless of you know whether whether it's small or large. I do think that the the nature of the challenges are different. I think Kate talked a little bit about the fact that operating with with large distributed global infrastructure means that th there are complications in doing that. But I think also the nature of the services that that a company like Facebook provides, right? So by definition, when you're communicating with somebody globally across borders, the data needs to flow. Um, it needs to flow in those ways, um, and and that's that's a critical piece of this. And and I think you know, in some ways, you know, companies that are, that are larger have greater ability to you know build data centers and things like that. But then the the services may become more disrupted. I think for a smaller company, whether that's you know a, a foreign company trying to do business, making a decision whether to do business in India or whether it's an Indian company trying to do business in another country that might impose data localization requirements there, um, the costs become quite catastrophic and, and quite prohibitive very often, um, particularly if there are different kinds of requirements on different different ways that data has to be structured in order to comply with data localization requirements in different ways. And I think that goes back to um, my comment earlier about um, my, my comment earlier about there being different different approaches that don't require segmenting data in these ways um, in, in order to solve some of these underlying problems. On, on the question of, of sort of preserving the ability for Indian firms to engage in innovation, um, I think this is this is a really critical thing, and I think you know we very much think about. Our, our role in the ecosystem and, and as a collaborative one and one that requires us where our success is, is, is greater if there is a more robust ecosystem of innovation. And I think you know, some of the work that we've talked about around emerging technologies like AI um, is a good example of this where um, you know, building, building collaborations where, for example, you know, there's innovation that happens Sorry, I've lost you there. Uh, there some seems to be an issue with the audio. Uh, I can't hear you, Rob. You're okay. muted now. OK, uh, fine. You're right. back. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I was, I was, I was saying. I think you know one of the things that that we very much think about is our success is tied to a robust global ecosystem and particularly innovation. Um, and it's it's one of the reasons why actually we've invested in Indian startups directly, but also in in initiatives that help ensure the success of the Indian startup ecosystem is because we will do better if there's innovation that's happening in the ecosystem that can intersect with our platforms and 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 people can use to to build technology and services on top um, and so I think that's that that is a critical piece of this too I, I to, to the particular piece around localization I don't think it's necessary or or sufficient for that matter for data to to be stored in um, in a particular place in order to enable those kinds of innovation and investment and actually I think one of the things that is most powerful um, is enabling people in India to make choices about what services they want to use who they want to communicate with and, and giving them autonomy to make those choices while having having confidence that their data is being protected wherever it goes. 
Thank you. Thanks. I'm coming to you, Rishabh, now with this question. You know, a lot of us who are in the research space says, you know, there should be informed policy making, and this is not the right way to go, and you should think about the cost and benefits. But really, there is little, and I know Carnegie is trying to fix that, but there is little in terms of actual applied research. So what are the gaps there? You know, what prevents us from getting this holistic picture, and who is responsible really for putting that kind of data out to get a better understanding of the costs and benefits of localization? <clears throat> I think that's actually a really interesting question because, and it also ties into this issue of trust that you were talking about earlier, because it appears very often in the Indian context, you do have these three constituencies, the government companies, which you can somewhat segregate into Indian and foreign companies or, or whatever, and the consumer, and each is firing off the shoulder of the other in order to get something that, you know, they feel that their constituency requires. Um, though, of course, there has been a tremendous amount of work been happening on this issue over the last couple of years. They have been macroeconomic studies in India as well. I think uh, there was one by ICREA, I think, last year, for example, which looked at, uh, you know, the, the economic effects in India. And so there has been a significant amount of writing, even by groups like um, the CIS and so on and so forth. But as you mentioned, one of the biggest problems we have in India is the fact that there just isn't an adequate evidence base, whether it's in terms of looking at the kind of law enforcement requests that have come in, um, you know, to try and make a case for, say, localization to enable, uh, we, we, we just have what Facebook and Google and, you know, these big tech companies put out on their own. But in fact, if you look at our own laws, they require them to maintain absolute secrecy with respect to all the requests they receive, this, that and the other. So there is a significant lack of transparency in the entire process and the way things are carried out. Also, of course, one shouldn't forget that the entire process of consultation itself is somewhat lacking. I mean, the RBI directive came under significant criticism because they just it was just passed without actually consulting the industry players. Um, similarly, off late, there's been a lot of talk about whether the uh, Joint Parliamentary Committee, which is looking at the PDP bill, is actually, say, going to involve civil society members um, and call them to depose before it. So far, it has, uh, for instance, you know, spoken to the state or to various state agencies as well as big companies. Um, so there is... Um, much work to do in terms of involving all the stakeholders in this digital ecosystem, trying to create an evidence base which allows you to make decisions which are then uh, more targeted, as we spoke about earlier, rather than sort of putting in place these generic norms that may or may not work, may or may not solve whatever problem, and at the same time could also possibly lead to a whole host of unintended consequences, as has been pointed out by uh, both Raap and Kate, for example. Um, so yeah, no, I think this is an area where we are likely to see more work happening in the in the future. Um, let's not forget that actually, I mean, in the last 10, 15 years, I mean, data localization, at least in my lifetime, first came up post the Snowden um, issue in about 2013, when Brazil particularly was really, really involved in this entire issue. India was very, very quiet at that point of time. I mean, there wasn't much talk about either this whole data sovereignty concept or the economic implications and so on. It's only now the last couple of years that we sort of realized that this is becoming an increasingly important place and that India has a role to play in this place. Um, so I think as, um, you know, in, in the coming few years, we will see a lot more research in this space, but hopefully, of course, the government will also try and support civil society and academia to produce more in this space. Thanks. So I'm going to take a couple of questions that have come from the audience. And I guess, you know, this is directed at Rob, but I'm going to direct it at both Rob and Kate. Uh, so the question says that the ECPA allows companies to voluntarily disclose subscriber information, but the rules and manner of this disclosure are really set by the private companies themselves. And, you know, should they be setting these rules or should there be some broader framework around how voluntary disclosures happen? Kate, do you want to go first, or I can I, I can start off. So, so I think that in in general, the, the I think that's right that 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 companies have some discretion in how they in how they respond to to um, requests for data from from governments. And in our case, um, we have we we publish law enforcement guidelines that articulate the specific standards that we use, what data is is provided in response. And I think, as Rashad noted, we also publish a transparency report that discloses you know the 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 numbers of requests that we receive, how frequently we. Provide provide data in response to those requests. So both on the on the substance of what the standards are that we're applying and um, 
and on the frequency of the, the request, we try to be transparent on that. I think there is an overlay, um, and I think this is some of what we talked about earlier in terms of the, the MLAT process or government to government relationships um, that applies a standard set of privacy protections and, and, and uh, evidentiary protections and standards to any request that happens um, on a cross-border basis. And so I do think that there's also a role for the that kind of government to government agreement that sets standards for how data should be how, how data should be provided. Um, that's something that that you know you know Facebook obviously or or any company makes a judgment about its particular circumstances. The data that we hold is a little different than other companies hold, and so I think there will always be a need for that. But I think there's also a need for governments to agree on what sort of a an overriding standard is and and the way that data should be exchanged um, when different governments are looking for it. Thank you. Kate, would you like to add something to that? I don't have too much to add. I mean, I think the, the transparency component that Rob mentioned is really important. We do um, uh, publish our, our transparency tools. We provide access and control tools um, for, for governments to exercise sovereignty. Um, in terms of voluntary disclosures, we, we've got clear principles on how voluntary disclosure happens that are dependent on local laws. Um, uh, and, and we're always evaluating risk assessments and developing internal processes accordingly. Um, but uh, but I think I think Rob Rob covered a lot of this. Thank you. Thank um, Ralph. We have a question for you, uh, which is basically around this, you know, the personal and the non personal debate which we are having in India right now. And the question goes that the EU has looked extensively at questions of anonymization and uh, whether you know when is data truly anonymous and with india now looking into questions of segregating these kinds of data what are your views on the need for common definitions and standards for personal and non-personal data um common de definitions within your country or or common definitions sort of at a at, at a global level i um, think the question meant within your country but i'm going to let you speak both at also at the global level <laughs> no i mean uh, uh at least in, in, in our conception, uh, uh, there, there is in a way one definition and it's the dividing line in a way between personal and non-personal. Huh? There, there, there's only these two uh, categories. Um, uh, the, the question is how do you sort of, uh, where do you draw the line? Uh, and in particular, um, sort of, uh, is, it, is, it, uh, um, is it a situation uh, uh, where uh, re-identification is uh, impossible uh, is is that what 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 the, the defines uh, uh, anonymous data uh, for, impossible for whom uh, is it just the uh, let's say the entity that holds the data or does it have to be impossible for anyone uh, so in 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 our uh, legal regime uh, we uh, we start from from the assumption that uh, as long as uh, re-identification is possible with let's say uh, a reasonable uh, amount uh, of, of of time and resources invested uh, by anyone not just the the entity holding uh, uh, the data but by anyone then uh, it, it has to be considered personal data uh, uh, because for example if you just uh, think about a data breach if you lose uh, some of the data even if you would uh, were not able to to re-identify but somebody else is then of course uh, uh, that means uh, uh, there uh, that other entity might be able to 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 re-identify uh, link that that data to an individual uh, and that means from the start it should be protected as personal data so so that that's 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 our conception um in let's say in general terms uh, uh, of course it gets much much more uh, complicated when you get to the technical uh, level as to how to ensure that uh, and 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 as always, I guess where technology is involved, it's it's a bit of a how do you call it in English uh, like a a, a race uh, between uh, those that sort of work on on ways to anonymize uh, and those that work on ways to to sort of break through the the anonymization. Um, so 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 I think that's where where then uh, the expertise of a data protection authority, for example, I think comes in. Uh, it's not something which you I think once and for all you can say I don't know if you. If you this, this, and this, uh, you, you have created anonymous data. Uh, uh, it might change over time. I mean, this is something which has to do with the technological development, uh, with the the, the uh, capabilities that exist at a certain point in time. Uh, 
Um, uh, so uh, that's why we have guidelines from our data protection authorities. They actually will now be uh, revised because they are from 2013. Uh, so, so you can already see seven years actually in that space is, is, is quite long. Uh, you, you, you need to update this. But, but at least conceptually, that that is the uh, that is the the dividing line. Um, uh, the important thing is that you should only call something anonymous data if really, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, nobody can link it to to an individual. Uh, otherwise, it should be protected as as personal data, which of course doesn't mean it cannot be used, but it should be then used with the specific protections that that uh, are there to protect the individual. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. <coughs> And Trinity, if, it, if it's okay, maybe I can add just one comment and sure, um, yes, reaction to what Ralph just said. I, I, so I, I think when, when when I think about sort of the interaction between different laws that have different standards for anonymization, I think it actually goes to sort of the conflict of laws issue that we were talking about in some way in, in response to law enforcement. And what I mean by that is if, if the European standard is what Ralph just described and has a, a fairly high bar for what, what falls outside of the, the category of personal data. Um, if another country, so for example, I know that India is looking at sort of this idea of requiring disclosure of non-personal data. If there's a different standard where um, disclosure might be required under Indian law, but then prohibited under European law because the two have a mismatch, um, it puts us in, in, in a particularly untenable position for sort of any company that would have to make a decision of, you know, do we disclose and and you know, run, run potentially run afoul of of one country's laws that says we're not allowed to disclose. And so the, the current situation, and actually we've done a fair amount of of privacy preserving data disclosure and very high level aggregate. Um, Dad, I talked about sort of the disaster response and COVID response work, but there are other examples of that. And I think that's a case where, you know, because we're able to do it voluntarily and because we're able to do it in a context where, um, where you know, we can set the sort of highest possible standard. So there's really no question about this. You know, you can avoid a lot of those questions. If you get closer to the line, um, then I do think it becomes more challenging, to, particularly in a case where you're required to disclose data. Thank you. Thanks for that. And Rishav, I'm going to come to you quickly with a question and then I believe we are running out of time. So I also want to give you all 30 seconds or you know 20 to wrap up with your closing remarks. But Rishav, the question for you is how do you see startups in India being impacted economically as a result of the PDP bill? Um, well, as a starter, there will be a cost. I mean, obviously, there's a cost of compliance, um, you know, ranging from consent, gathering consent to putting in place security measures and so on. So there is undoubtedly going to be an increased cost in some senses. I mean, that's just a quick answer. Um, of course, you could point to compliance costs in many other sectors, whether it's the environment, so on and so forth, where you do as a society decide to balance these kind of economic costs with the broader needs of society. The question is whether these costs are adequately balanced and whether they're actually getting you commensurate gains in terms of privacy rights. Um, but undoubtedly, of course, there will be a cost to Indian companies, you know, and particularly, say, in the context of localization, given that India doesn't at the moment have great infrastructure, does not have a large amount of data centers, um, of course, it's inefficient to build data centers in India for a variety of reasons, starting out with the weather, the lack of, you know, or, or, or the intermittent electricity supply. I mean, industry players in India have pointed to how it's tough to even, say, acquire land, so on and so forth, to build data centers. So Indian companies will not have the ability now to just say, OK, I'm going to use a cloud service provider, which may be based in some other part of the world, but is providing me a cheaper solution. This also means then that it's possible that costs are likely to be passed on to users. Um, so again, if we look at how a lot of the sort of bigger companies have responded, even Indian companies have responded to localization requests, they actually haven't been too bothered because they know, as you pointed out earlier, that they can set up the sort of um, infrastructure that is required. For, for smaller companies, obviously, it's going to be a problem. Okay, thank you. And with that, I think 30 seconds each, how do all of you see, you know, from your respective stakeholder group that you speak for in a post pandemic world, uh, you know, localization debates panning out and what are the priorities? Uh, let me start with you, Kate. Sure. Um, no, I, I think I just reiterate, we believe India should have strong privacy law, um, that it's not incompatible with free flow of data across borders. Um, as you mentioned, COVID has reinforced and given new fresh examples of the importance of that. Um, we think going forward, certifications is a way of achieving that, although, as Ralph mentioned, it has to be concurrent um, with a strong regime. 
um, and we're really looking forward to engage on the dialogue both in India and, and globally. Thank you. Ralph, can I come to you next? Yes, uh, so I, I, I concur with that, with Kate just, just that, and, and, and I think we, we should focus on, on the reasons for uh, why why uh, uh, there is a call for for data localization and 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 I think we should really think hard whether there aren't other ways to to address these issues, uh, be it uh, law enforcement access, uh, for which I think there can be multilateral, bilateral, but but also multilateral uh, solutions such as the Cybercrime Convention, uh, uh, privacy protection. Where uh, as as Kate just said, I think. Uh, there are ways uh, to, to have both, to allow flows, but to make sure that certain protections go with the data uh, uh, and, and, and there are different tools for that. Um, and, and, and when it is about uh, sort of pooling data, having a, a basis for, for artificial intelligence and other forms of, of innovation, then I think, uh, and, and we are having this debate right now in Europe, maybe one should think about ways to, to facilitate data sharing also, uh, so, so that you that 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 you make sure that data is not held just by by some important players, by platforms or others, uh, but but that others can benefit from this. Of course, uh, with the appropriate protections around it, in particular uh, uh, data protection when it, when it concerns personal data. But but all of these things, I think, are possible, uh, and and one can think through, them, uh, and they don't require data localization. Thank you, Rob. Can I come to you next? Sure. So, I, I mean, I think, uh, Smriti, as, as you and Rishabh were talking about before, I think that there's this concept of trust that underlies a lot of these discussions and really, you know, making sure that that we build trust in the way that the data ecosystem operates. And I, I've shared that I have some concerns about, you know, e even though the, the policy goals that we've talked about are all really important, whether localization is the best way to achieve them. But I do think that that all of the stakeholders that you've mentioned have, have you know, have a stake and, and have a responsibility in, 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 you know, working to build trust. And that, that requires, you know, governments to be clear about what the requirements are so that companies can follow them on, on the part of companies. Obviously, we need to be responsive and communicative with governments and actually build privacy protections in response to these things. And governments also have a role um, between uh, amongst each other um, in working to deal with some of these cross-border <laughs> conflict of laws issues that we've talked about. I think all of those things are really important to have a robust and functioning data ecosystem. But if the end, at the end of the day, the goal is to empower um, India as, as an economy and then also individual people in, in the country to make choices about what how they want to communicate and make sure that their data is protected, all of that work needs to be done. So I think we do have a lot of work, but if we sort of focus on sort of building trust in the overall ecosystem, I think there's a path forward that, that, that can potentially avoid some of the challenges that we've talked about. Thank you, Rishabh. So um, I'm just very quickly gonna just uh, you know build on some of the points I made earlier, which is I think we do need to sort of revisit these broad norms that we are looking at in India. I mean, try and articulate the specific goals and look at alternatives as has been mentioned previously. Also, I think it's really really important, even if we are putting in place these kind of norms, to try and look at the broader ecosystem, both in terms of law as well as implementation. So, for instance, there's clearly a need to you know relook at our surveillance framework in India. I mean, it, it we have outdated laws which have been criticized by all and sundry but nothing really seems to be happening about this and then we hear about more proposals for instance to um, say in the intermediary guidelines rules to require traceability or the breaking of encryption and all these kind of issues so this is going to become really really problematic should we then you know go ahead with both localization as well as putting in place all these other measures um so ideally i would actually like to see more organic growth of the sector i mean i would I, I so in that sense i appreciate that the steps that the government has sort of look to take some steps in this regard. So whether you look at, say, the e-commerce policy in 2019, the draft e-commerce policy, which said, OK, we're going to try and accord infrastructure state, uh, status to data centers. We've had the last budget, which also says we're going to come up with a national data center policy and try and provide some incentives to the space. So I think there are ways in which the government can actually achieve its ends without sort of using the big stick that it wields. Um, and that might be a route to examine. And of course, uh, what uh, Raf was talking about, I think it's particularly important that we do deal with a lot of these issues at the international level. We're not going to get away without, you know, having some sort of broader accord on issues of privacy, of competition, so on and so forth. And in the absence of, and, and, and in some ways, it, it, it also takes a bit of understanding from the sort of more developed countries to understand that these are the concerns that developing countries have. And so not talking past each other, I think is particularly important. 
Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time, for being part of the debate. And I, I think on behalf of all of us, I should thank the Carnegie team for giving us the opportunity to have this debate. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye to everyone.